What we're going to do this weekend, when Pastor asked me to come, it's the weekend before Thanksgiving. I said, well, let's do something with a Thanksgiving theme. Uh, the Battle for Faith, Family, and Freedom is partly, that's part of what we're going to be doing. By the way, the Arise ministry, Awake, was taken. But Vance Havner said before his death, our churches are sound, sound asleep. And I think that's the key problem. I think that's our churches are sound asleep. So we really need to awaken. Well, awake is taken. That name is taken. So I'm thinking about what can I call this thing? And right after uh, this is going on, my dad would have celebrated his 99th birthday on September 4th had he lived. Maybe they celebrate birthdays in heaven. I don't know. But he, uh, he often would wake me up in the morning. I grew up on a farm, as you know. And dad would often come to the back door and yell my name and rise and shine. So I, as I'm thinking about my dad, I came across Isaiah 60, verse 1, Arise and shine. Now, I don't know if that's where dad got it from or not. I'd never seen that before. Isn't that funny how you read the Bible over and over and see something you never... That wasn't there before, was it? Uh, yeah, it was, probably was. You got the screen on for me, guys? We'll go ahead with the presentation. You don't want to stay here all night. So we're going to think about Thanksgiving. I hit the extra button. So uh, turn your Bibles to uh, the book of Psalms. We're going to think tonight about Thanksgiving. We're going to look at our past as a country, part of our Christian heritage. Then tomorrow morning, we're going to look at our present, where we're at now. The Sunday school hour, I will upset you, de depress you. Um, you know, we'll talk about the elections. We'll talk about uh, Ebola. We'll talk about education a little bit. We'll talk about some of those. That'll be kind of a downer. Then in the morning service, I'm going to talk about, about what God's willing to do right now in our lives, how he's helping us. So that's our Christian help. So our Christian heritage, our Christian help. And then in the afternoon, we're going to talk about the rapture. Uh, one of the things uh, in this ministry, the old ministry, I've not been preaching much on prophecy. I enjoy prophecy. So I have a message, a PowerPoint on the rapture. We're going to talk about the who, what, when, and where. I took that from Tony Saxton. Uh, we're going to talk about that at those aspects. So tonight we're going to think about our past. Now, I'm hoping this is not too dry. I have not done this before. And as there's, a, there's some three historical documents that I want you to, to understand. And I think it becomes very apparent. But Psalm 100 uses this phrase, thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. No Ye that he is the is God, he is see that have made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. That's Psalm one hundred. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name, for the Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. I love that last verse. His truth endureth to all generations. Barb and I have four kids. We have 12 grandchildren. I am thankful that that heritage that I have that was given to us by my parents, Barb's parents, can now be passed down to our kids and to our grandkids and someday to their kids as well. So do, America is one of two nations in the world that has a Thanksgiving Day. Who's the other? Canada. And when is it? October 12th. We celebrate Columbus Day. They celebrate Thanksgiving Day that day. I think their merchants have better uh, lobbyists. I think that's how that happened. Because some of our merchants, have you noticed the shopping stuff has moved? We, we had Black Friday. Only in America could you have people fighting and scrapping the day after Thanksgiving over stuff. You know, it's only in America that that happens. Then, um, they, but they've moved that. I got, I've got ads already. Black Friday started early, and some of the stores are opening at you know, 5 o'clock in our area. Some are opening or it's kind of sad, really. The whole thing's kind of sad. That is not working for me, guys. Did I turn it off? You're going to have to help me, I guess. I'm not moving. There we go. Did you do it or did I? You did it. All right, I may have to click you. Uh, this expression is found six times in the book of Psalms. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Now, you and I really don't need a reason for thanking God. You ought to simply be thankful that he is good. 
God is good. The Bible reassures us again and again that God is good. God is good. And he is, his mercy endures forever. He's not going to run out of mercy for you. He's not going to say, well, you used up your quota, you're done. Uh, it's forever and ever. That phrase is found again and again in the Psalms. If God says something once, he wants us to know it. If he says it twice, that's to draw our attention to it. But if he says it six times, we ought to get the message. There is a command. We are to be thankful. Now, I hadn't thought about it, but I, 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 as we were singing tonight, I thought of Romans 1, the first step toward apostasy or departure from the faith. They, they glorified not, neither were they thankful. Uh, lack of being thankful is, it, is a first step away from God. When you and I are not thankful for what God has done in our life, then pride fills in. And we can to begin to think we deserve all these blessings that God has given to us. It's a, really, it's a sad commentary. Go ahead to the next slide. If I, let me see if the battery can be turned and that helps. There we go. The New Testament, Colossians 3, 14 and 15, above all these things, above all these things, so this is a priority thing, put on charity and love, which is the bond of perfection or perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called into one body, and be ye thankful. You know, it's a very clear command that's given to us. Now, if we're going to think about Thanksgiving, we saw there, uh, Israel didn't have a Thanksgiving service per se. In some ways, every worship service is a Thanksgiving service. But they did have seven feasts, and the seven feasts all had significance as to their past, but also had significance to their future. And, and if we took the time to study the seven feasts, you'd find that some of them were in the spring of the year and some of them were in the fall. The ones in the spring speak of the first coming of Christ. The ones in the fall speak of the second coming. One of the significant uh, feasts was the Feast of Tabernacles. Sukkot, it is called. And that was a feast. Just when I raise my hand, if you can, this is just not working. I'm sorry. Turn on and off to see if that helps. The feast was designed to, to help them remember their wilderness journey. They were delivered out of Exodus. They spent 40 years in the wilderness, and God wanted them to remember their past. It's important to remember the past. Now, the way they did that is, by the time of Jesus, they built booths, and they lived in little booths. So this was, a, this was kind of a camp out. Israel, they had their homes, they'd leave their homes, they'd go out, and they would gather together, and they'd build little booths, and that would be the booth that they, they how they celebrated the, the celebration of pa Passover. Our Thanksgiving really roots back to the Reformation. These are four of the leaders of the Reformation. Um, from left to right is Zwingli, Luther, Cranmer, who is from England, and Calvin. You may not know all of them, but these, these are the guys who came out of the Catholic Church they were exposed to the Word of God. They began studying it for themselves, and they said, wait a minute, what is in this book is not what we're hearing on Sunday in the church. And they, they said, we've got to believe the Bible. So you know the story, I'm sure, of Luther and his 95 Thesis and uh, Calvin and others. Uh, they emphasized five things. Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone. Not the church, not the Pope, but the Bible. Solo fidelity, by faith alone. We're saved by faith, not by works. Uh, solo Christos, through Christ alone. Solo gratia, by grace alone. Those two and three are similar. And then, uh, or four are similar. And then, by, for the glory of God alone. That's the theme of the Reformation. Now, the Reformation took a different form in England, but... This is, this is kind of a statement. You won't be able to read that very well. I'm, I, this is Luther at the Diet of Worms. Now, it, it always struck me as an odd thing when they would mention the Diet of Worms. You're going to eat worms? It really meant a court. Luther was forced to stand before the German princes and give an account. They wanted him to recant what he had said about the Catholic Church. And this is what he said. Unless I am convinced... Uh, by precept from Scripture, or by the plain and clear 
reason of arguments, I cannot and will not and can't, for there's neither safe, safe nor wise to do anything. Uh, I can't say we're against, against conscience, okay? I can't quite raise it. But he end up, here I stand. Basically, he said, I'm going to stand on the word of God. I'm going to stand on the word of God. Now, Luther and these guys were not perfect. They messed up on a lot of things. Infant baptism, state church, a whole bunch of stuff. But their basic, basic goal was to be true to the scriptures. That's what they tried to do. Uh, they failed, but remember, they, you know, you and I probably come short a lot of times too. Well, let's look at the uh, England. I'm sorry, this is just not working. Henry VIII was not supposed to be come king. He had an older brother. His older brother died, and Henry then is the next in line. He becomes king. He not only inherited a, the kingship, he also inherited a wife that he didn't like. Uh, he didn't like her. She didn't like him. He decided to annul the marriage. He went to the pope with an emissary. He had an emissary go to the pope and wanted the marriage annulled. But she was the daughter of the Queen of Spain. Uh, a king and king, queen of Spain, and the Pope said, no, I'm not doing that. So old Henry decided he's going to break from the church and declared himself to be the head of the church in England. That uh, move was earth-shattering, to say the least. The question was, will the church be Catholic, or it will, be, will it be Protestant, Protestant or Reformed? Two groups arose, one that's loyal Catholics, and one that's Puritans, and wanted to purify the church. And then there's a whole bunch of people in the middle. Now we have a succession. of Henry dies, not leaving an heir. Uh, well, briefly, Edward, his son, reigns. He's the boy king. And then Mary, Bloody Mary, you've heard of her in history. She was Catholic and tried to wipe out the Protestants, including the leaders of the Reformation in England. And then Elizabeth. Elizabeth said, you know what? The church is broad enough, a big enough tent. We're going to have everybody under it. You ever hear that big tent stuff? That's partly where it came from. Is she said, we're just going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to chart our own course. Well, that battle then between Protestant or Catholic continued. There was all kinds of conspiracy, all kinds of stuff going on. And uh, the Puritans really made grounds, then they lost grounds. And there's another group that said, you know what? This is, this is, the church is too messed up to purify it. What we need to be is separate. We need to start a separate church. Now, we call those people the pilgrims. That's where they came from. They were persecuted. The king and the bishop of, uh, of, the, of the Church of England demanded that you worship the way he wanted you to worship. So you preach a certain sermon, pastor. You pray a certain prayer. You read the prayer book. And there were men like John Robinson said, we can't do that. We're going to start our own church. Now, I used to think it was large numbers of people in England. It was not a large number. They're really small groups, but this church was one of the largest. It had about 250 members. But because they were persecuted, they went to Holland. They lived there about 10 years, but they didn't like what was happening to their young people. The young people were becoming more Dutch than English. They considered themselves Englishmen. Uh, the kids are starting to speak Dutch instead of English, and there was a threat of a war between Holland and England at that time. This is the time of colonization, and um, it, was, it was kind of a rough thing. And they couldn't practice their trades. They were basically people that were shopkeepers and that kind of stuff. And so they, they decided they're going to they're gonna go to the New World. So they pool their money together. They didn't have enough money, so they contracted with some merchants. Uh, they rented two ships or hired two ships to take them, the Speedwell and the Mayflower, and they're going to go to the New World and start a new colony. They got permission from the king to do that. They're going to settle in Virginia. So everything's set. However, when they started, <laughs> the Speedwell started to sink. So they turned that ship around, and Pastor Robinson, who was the pastor of the church, said, you know what, uh, the people who are going to stay behind need me more than the people who are going to the new world. I'll stay here, and I'll, you go, and I'll, I'll join you later. He died before he was able to do that. This is kind of how their journey uh, looked. They ended up being blown 200 miles off course. The ship almost sunk. 
the, uh, uh, the main mast, our main beam cracked and the, and the thing. If you travel to uh, Massachusetts, go to Plymouth Plantation. Plymouth is spelled with an I. It's just south of Boston. It's not too far from Cape Cod. Cape Cod's where they actually landed. But they took about a month exploring the coastline and finding a place to settle. These, these were remarkable people. 102 pilgrims made the journey. 102. Half of them died the first year. They landed in December. I mean, they went on shore permanently in December. And uh, what, a, what a job they had. That beam that cracked, they had brought a, a screw for a printing press, and they were able to use that to, to support the ship. Go sometime to Plymouth Plantation, go inside the ship in the hold, and realize that they stayed there basically for 65 days. There's not room enough to stand up erect if you're, unless you're short. Um, it had been used for transporting wine, and so the, it had a smell. Uh, the pilgrims in their writings talk about the smell of, um, you know, not wine, but, you know, wine that sits as vinegar, so you've got that kind of smell going on. It was really kind of a bad deal. So they, they arrive. Um, William Bradford, who becomes their leader, says, Being arrived in a good harbor and brought to a safe land, we fell upon our knees and blessed the God of heaven, who had brought us over to this vast and furious ocean. By all accounts, it was a rough, rough voyage. Now, Barb and I traveled to Spain this year. We got in a plane in the evening. We had breakfast in Spain the next morning. Uh, that's the way it is. We had breakfast with our daughter coming back, had breakfast with our daughter, had lunch in New York City, and had supper in our home in Greece. Um, travel's a lot easier now than it is back then. Can you imagine 66 days at sea, and you've never been to sea before in your life. Uh, there's no doubt seasickness and, uh, and all the rest that went with that. But you can imagine them being very happy. The first thing they build is a, a fort, which is also the meeting place, which is their church meeting. They build it on the top of a hill. This is from Plymouth Plantation. They recreated the whole uh, thing. Uh, the, looking down from the hill, you see the houses. They built fences. It's right on the harbor. Uh, they, the Mayflower stuck with them until the springtime, but it was a rough winter. They had brought some food with them. They didn't really starve. It was really more cold and disease. And I mean, it's December, and they got to build a house. So they're putting these things together. This is recreated as though it were 1628, eight years. They've been in the colony about eight years at that time. I have more pictures of that, but I, I'll show you tonight. The place that they settled had been a Indian village, but the Indians were all gone. Uh, they wondered about that. They even found some corn, which was unknown to them. And one day as they're praying in the, in the springtime, they got to plant their crops. They brought seed to plant, but they really weren't sure how to do any of this. They weren't really farmers. And they had hoped to, uh, to harvest lumber and send it back to England. That was one of the commodities. And they also hoped to fish off of Cape Cod. They understood that they'd been explored. They understand there's good fishing, but they only had one little boat to do that with. So how are you going to survive? How are you going to make it? Well, they were praying. As they were praying, an Indian came out of the woods one day and said, Hello, Englishman. His name was Samuel Set. He introduced them to Squanto. Squanto had probably been captured by Spanish uh, uh, sailors, taken back to Spain, somehow made his way back to England, and somehow got back home. When he got back home to his tribe, that's, it was his tribe that was there. They had all died of disease. So they had been clear. So the land was vacant. The other Indians kind of left them alone as well. Had they landed in Virginia where they wanted to, or some say New York City, New York Harbor, uh, they would have found hostile Indians. But in this case, it's, it's wide open. Plus the Dutch were claiming some of that land, so it would have been dangerous. So God went before them and helped them. He stayed with them. Uh, Bradford says, Squanto continued with the pilgrims and was their interpreter and a special instrument of God for their good beyond their expectation. He directed them to how to set their corn, where to take fish, to procure other commodities, and also to uh, pilot to bring them to unknown places for their profit, and never left them till he died. Now, one of the foods he introduced them to was eel. I did not know that until I was preparing for this message. I, I'm not sure I'd be overly excited about having eel to eat, but they, 
he really bailed them out. They uh, met Chief Massawet, who was the name for Massachusetts, uh, made a treaty. The treaty was one of mutual friendship. They had been hit by disease as well. They were a different tribe than the one that had died out. But they had been hit by disease and were being forced to pay tribute to a more powerful tribe. And by allying themselves with the English, they put them in a position where they could break those bonds. And so it worked out well for them. They granted the pilgrims, I think, 12,000 acres of land to, for themselves. So it's time for Thanksgiving. Uh, the harvest starts coming in. The colony spared. There's only 50 of them left. Uh, apparently, uh, it may have only been four adult women. It's good. Four women are said to have done the cooking. And what did they have to eat? Well, Bradford talks about fish, waterfall, turkeys, which is only known in the United States. There's none in Europe. And then venison. Uh, the Indians brought five deer. There were 90 Indians and 50 pilgrims. So you can tell they... They had a great deal of trust that would later not be, you know, you'd be real nervous being around that. What else do they have to eat? Well, it's uh, Edward Lins uh, Winslow, who's also one of these founders, said, And God be praised, we had a good increase, our harvest being gotten in, our governor and four men set our following, so we might have a special um, Mary, re uh, Mary rejoice together. These things I thought good to let you understand that you may give, uh, might on our behalf give God thanks who has dealt so bountifully with us. So even having lost half of them, after the harvest, they say, God has been so good to us. And look at all he's accomplished in this short period of time. They have a colony, they're established. What did they eat? Well, uh, the Indians, Iroquois, here call them the three sisters. These are American foods. These are not known in Europe. Uh, we're not known in Europe at that time. The three are beans, squash, and maize, which we call corn. Now, the corn did not look like that corn. That's hybrid corn. You've seen Indian corn. Uh, it's more wild. That's what they had to eat. Maize uh, was unknown in Europe. Now, the word corn simply means grain. So you will see that in the Bible. The corn of wheat, for instance. It's not talking about an ear of corn. It's an ear of grain. That's the idea but the, it's a good name for it. Uh, squash. Um, most of you will probably have squash at your Thanksgiving celebration. And a lot of people have corn, corn casserole and such. We had corn tonight. Uh, and beans. Beans maybe not so much, but uh, not green beans. These are these other kinds of beans. But uh, that's, that's the three that really got them through. These were natural crops. These are crops that could grow in Massachusetts. Now, if you've been to the colony, it's not good soil. When I went there, I thought my dad would say you'd never buy a piece of this land because it's, it's, not, it's not designed for agriculture. The one thing that grows good in that area that's not mentioned, what grows in Massachusetts well in that area, do you know? Cranberries, yeah. Cranberry, we have it, you'll have cranberries probably, but uh, it's not mentioned by any of the records at all. Well, uh, from that time on, this was a time of thanksgiving. This is what they gathered for. Now, it's amazing that textbooks today are changing this, that they, they had this celebration to thank the Indians for what had happened. That is really not true. They were thanking God, and they wanted their Indian friends to know the same God that they knew. Uh, Squanto professed to Christ as his Savior. Uh, other colonies had delis of celebration. The first thanksgiving, if you're from Virginia, anybody from Virginia? All right, you had the first Thanksgiving. So you can scrap part of what I just said. It actually happened in Jamestown, but we don't have much record of it. But they had a day of Thanksgiving to God for bringing them over to this good land. So it does, you know, it goes back in our history a long ways. Now, uh, during the American Revolution, the first national day of Thanksgiving was held. That was held during the Revolutionary War by order of the Continental Congress, who said, for as much as it is the indispensable duty of all men to adore the superintending providence of Almighty God, to acknowledge with gratitude their obligation to him for benefits received and deplore such further blessings as they stand in need of. Now, that's only a part of the proclamation, but you get the idea there. Now, I'm going to read the next couple a little more. Um, I guess this is still part of it. Uh, I'll, I'm going to skip part of that. Oh, I did want to include that, excuse one part. 
at the very end, what is the basis of prayer? Whereby, this is at one time, that at one time, with one voice, the good people may express the grateful feelings of their hearts and concentrate themselves to the service of the divine benefactor, that together with their sincere acknowledgments and offerings, they may join the pertinent confession of their manifold sins, whereby they have forfeited every favor. We don't deserve anything we're getting, but whereby they have forfeited every favor, and their humble and earnest supplication, and may please God through the merits of... Can you imagine the Congress today giving that kind of proclamation? We want the whole people of the United States to call on Jesus Christ for mercy. That's, that's what they said. That's part of our heritage. Washington, when he was elected president, gave uh, a... This is the first Thanksgiving of the United States of America, because now we are an independent country. And uh, he starts out by saying, whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor, and that the day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed and acknowledged with grateful hearts, but with the many and signal favors of Almighty God, especially affording them an opportunity to peacefully establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. See, it was an amazing thing. The 13 colonies won the war, were able to form a more perfect union. He was elected to be president. Congress is now seated. We have a national government. And he says the right thing to do, once his first order, is, we need to take a day to just give thanks to God for what he's done for us. We need to acknowledge him. Abraham Lincoln uh, gave a national Thanksgiving in November, which is where we get the November date. Before he did that, in April, he gave a proclamation calling on the nation to a day of humiliation, prayer, and confession. This is, this is very significant. It's right in the midst of the war. It's 1863. The war is not going well. It's dragged on. It's costing a lot of lives. A lot of casualties. Uh, so Lincoln gives a proclamation calling for a day of, of national prayer and humiliation. Here's what he says. And whereas it is the duties of nations as well as men to acknowledge their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with a sure to hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history, that only those nations are blessed whose God is the Lord. And in so much as we know him by his divine law, nations, individuals are subject to punishments and chastisements in this world. May we not justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be a punishment inflicted upon us for our great presumptuous sin to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. Lincoln is saying, maybe this war is God's judgment on us for what we have done. Now, what have we done? We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. Now, that's our heritage. That's that's. That's the stuff that made America. Lincoln said, we have forgotten God. How is it we could forget God? But we've done that. We have forgotten the gracious hand that preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. We have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God who made us, it behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Now, therefore, in compliance with the request that is made by the Congress, and fully concurring with the views of the Senate, I do, by this proclamation, designate and set apart Thursday, the 30th day of April 1863, as a national day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer. That day was held... It was a national day of humiliation, confession, and prayer. In the midst of a divided land, of course, it's not observed in the south, but in the north. The results of that prayer 
probably resulted in two victories almost exactly on the 4th of July. One was Gettysburg, July 1 to 3, sometimes called the high point of the Confederacy. My great-grandfather Samuel Stiles was in the tree line and faced Pickett's charge. He had lied about his age to get into the military, served all the way through the war. At the end of the war was in the march in Washington where they were discharged in, in mass, took his rifle and threw it as far away as he could, never touched a gun the rest of his life. He had seen too much killing. He told my grandfather, my grandfather told me very vividly about the Battle of Gettysburg. It was, it was still, uh, it's not that long ago, but a significant, significant victory. The other one was Vicksburg, which uh, the siege lasts from May 18th to July 4th. It ended July 4th, and that gave the Union control of the Mississippi from New Orleans all the way up to uh, Vicksburg. Uh, that, that really is the turning point of the war. Now, the war did drag on for a couple more years, but that really is the turning point, and I think it came from prayer. So that fall, just shortly after he gave the Gettysburg Address, uh, Lincoln issued this proclamation. The year that is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties, which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come, others have been added, which is so extraordinary in nature, it cannot fail to penetrate and soften the heart, which is habitually insensible to the ever-watchful providence of Almighty God. Now, what he was saying is, in the midst of our time when we're fighting each other, we're at peace with the other nations of the world. Nobody's taking advantage of us. Nobody's raided. The, the crops are still being put in the ground, being harvested. We're still, we're still surviving. Then he says, no human counsel had devised or hath any mortal hand worked out these things. They are gracious gifts of the Most High God, who while dealing with us in anger for our sins, again, remember, this is judgment. We're being judged. And he said, uh, nevertheless, hath remembered mercy. It has seemed fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, gratefully acknowledged as with one heart, one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens, every part of the United States, and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands, to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November last, next, as a day of thanksgiving, praise, and praise to our benevolent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. So that's where we get the date, the fourth Thursday. That's where it came from. That's the first one. Uh, every president after, it wasn't a national holiday, though. Every president gave a proclamation. It wasn't on the calendar until the president set the date. Generally, it was the last Friday in, uh, instead of fourth Friday until we get to Roosevelt. Roosevelt, uh, in 19, this is 1938, and this is typical of the, the proclamations. Thus, from our earliest record of recorded history, Americans have thank God for their blessings. It, in our deepest natures, in our very souls, we as all mankind since the origin of mankind turn to God in time of trouble and a time of happiness, in God we trust. Isn't that interesting? The, uh, I, I have read all of the proclamations. It would, it would bore you to death, probably. But it's interesting, in years, for instance, when a president had been assassinated, the next year, the president might refer to judgment. Maybe this was God's judgment on us. They, if there were droughts and famine and things, they would say, maybe this is the cause. Today, we don't even think about that. But but they would recognize this, this is the hand of God in this, and we need to be thankful, and we need to implore him for his mercy. Roosevelt decided to make it a permanent holiday, and then finally in 1941 it was done, and they decided on the fourth Thursday of the month of November. And the reason for that was the merchants. Merchants wanted a longer, and by then it was pretty well established, Thanksgiving's followed by Christmas. Thanksgiving is the start of the shopping season, we want to make it a little bit, you know, when there's a five Thursdays in the month, that was a little late, so they wanted a little longer, and they made it the fourth, so that's why it's the fourth Thursday now. That's why we have it. This is one of my favorite. This is uh, President Reagan from 1986. Perhaps no custom reveals our characters and nation so clearly as our celebration of Thanksgiving Day. Now, you think about it. We're only one of two nations in all the world that take a day to thank God. Now, I have a problem today. That is, I'm not sure how many people are thanking God. I think there are people who think it's a day of family or a day of 
getting ready for shopping or even going shopping or football or it's about turkey or, you know, we've kind of forgotten what the purpose of the thing was. But he says, uh, rooted deeply in our Judeo-Christian heritage, the practice of offering thanksgiving underscores our unshakable belief that God is the found foundation of our nation and our firm reliance upon him for whom all blessings flow. Folks, we got to get back to this. We as a nation have got to get back to recognizing God is the one who prospers us. So Psalm 107, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people would begin thanking God? Now, where does this start? Well, it really starts with us and our families. I mean, we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving. Are you going to pause to give thanks to God? Are you really going to take time to say, what are you thankful for? We need, to, we need to recognize God has blessed us as a nation and people. We have been blessed like no one. Pick a spot in the world. Where would you rather live? You know, uh, With all our flaws, all our problems, this is still the best place on earth as far as I'm concerned. And it's because of God's mercy and grace. We ought to be very thankful. We ought to be thankful. Now, you need to teach your kids to be thankful. Our kids, when they were little, we taught them to say please and thank you. The table, that's where it starts. We, we pause to pray before we ate a meal. You teach them that. My little granddaughters over in Spain, you know, they, before we eat, they pray. I think I've told you about Mrs. Greer, my sixth grade uh, teacher. She, every day at noon, before we ate lunch, she said, all right, we're going to bow our heads and pray because even pigs bow their heads before they eat. <laughs> Never forgot that. You know, we need to be thankful, thankful, thankful. You know, and think about it, how it makes you feel when somebody says thank you to you. I mean, it's, and it blesses God. God is blessed by us being appreciative, thanking him. When somebody thanks you, what do you what's your impulse? Probably oh, that's nothing. You know, but inwardly there's kind of a, you know, that person really appreciated what I did. You have to do that thing for them again, aren't you? Um, we need to be thankful people. It ought to be characteristic. What's the opposite of being thankful? Complaining. Complaining. We ought to be thankful, not complainers. Heavenly Father, thank you for our heritage as Americans. It's a rich Christian heritage. The history books are being rewritten today, and it's all being edited out, but it's still a part of the heart and soul of America. God, I pray that you would revive us again. Help us to take our stand and show the way by leading through our churches and through our families. In Jesus' name, amen.